What is going on, everyone? I am Pat the Pac-Man. Welcome to Barking for Balance, the podcast where we talk about dogs, but we also talk about any topic that is meant to teach, inspire, and entertain. Today, I want to talk about a topic called Two Steps Forward and One Step Back. It relates to our lives as humans, but it also relates to our dogs on how we're going to teach them and how we're going to get them to do certain behaviors and how we're going to get them to improve in certain areas. I also want to discuss a little bit about how dogs associate certain activities or certain behaviors with the state of mind that they are in at that moment. So I'm going to go over those two topics. But before I get into that, I just got to get something off my chest because I'm going to call this segment the Pac-Man rant or when shit pops off or something like that. Um, maybe I'll put a little Sicilian spin on it. But when I met that Scorpia, when I think Scorpia, um, it's a topic that 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 it really is. It's a pet peeve. It's definitely a topic. I need to calm myself down because I get so pissed off about this. I was actually driving today and it happened. And I just, it, you know, I mean, I don't think about it anymore. But when it happens, oh, my God, it infuriates me. And you're saying, well, what, what the what the hell? Get, 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 get ball, get to school, get to you. Slow drivers in the fast lane, slow drivers in the left lane. Oh, my God. So. You know, I live here in New Jersey and, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm a fast driver. Like I drive at 95 miles an hour. I'm not going to say that I drive the speed limit. I'm not going to say anything because I want to, I don't want to incriminate myself here. But what I am going to say is that the, the fast lane, the left lane is called the fast lane or the passing lane. And so it's called the fast lane for a reason. It's also called the passing lane. So what it means is that if a car is going faster than you and you are in the left lane, then your ass needs to move over. It is that simple. Regardless of the speed that you're going, if another car is going faster than you are and they're catching up, then your ass needs to move over. This is such a pain in the ass topic. It pisses me off like you can't imagine it boils down to the concept of common sense, but I don't know if it's just a New Jersey thing. I'm not exactly sure, but, it, but I don't really think it's a New Jersey thing. I think it's just a, a universal situation. So today I'm driving and again, I'm not driving excessively over the speed limit. I'm not flying. I'm not like, you know, flying through past. I'm not flying past cars. You know, I'm not like, you know, fast and the furious and shit. No, I'm just driving above the speed limit. It's a little secret. I'm driving above the speed limit. And obviously, I get stuck in the left lane because is driving so slow. is basically like a piece of shit. Okay. Um, is driving so slow that there's like five cars. I'm like behind this dumbass. I'm behind him. And then there's like four or five other cars behind me. And it's like a funeral procession. It's like so freaking slow. And now there's cars in the other lanes that are passing us because this dumb shit is sitting, is sitting there in his car. So you know, it does happen when I'm in the car with my mom. And um I kind of tend to go off regardless of who's next to me. And I'll start I'll start cursing in Sicilian. Man, I'll, I'll say words that are just, you know, and I'll say stuff that my mom yells at me. Like I'll say, you know, stuff to towards the individual's family and, you know, certain things along those lines. I'm not going to get into it. But and my mom, no, 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 no. You can't say that. Of course, she says it in Italian. You can't say that's not very nice. No, you can't say that. I was like, you know what, Ma? I don't want to. I don't care. This idiot is, is I blame his family for this moron being born. So, 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 I've ever murdered his Oh, it's such so freaking annoying. If your ass is going slower, it's not really, it's not, it's common sense. Okay. If there's a car coming behind you, move your ass. Listen, it happens to me. Sometimes I'm driving in the fast lane, nobody behind me and I'm passing some cars and I'm just in the fast lane. There's no traffic, whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden I see a car approaching pretty quickly. So you know what I do? I I move over. It's common sense. Then you know what I do? I go back in the, in the left. And I go back in the, in the left lane. I go back in the fast lane because that's where I'm passing all the other cars. I'm going faster than the other cars. So it just makes sense to stay there, you know? But if another car is driving faster than me, I move over. I don't know if I just have common sense. I know in America, common sense has become a foreign language, but 
Meta di lato, move over. You see a car behind you. People are flashing their high beams. Sometimes it happens where I'm like, I'm getting, I'm getting off the next exit. So I'm not in the left lane. And I'll see this dumb fuck just driving so slow. And there's like eight, eight cars behind them just, just having to wait for this moron to go. And I'm, you know, I'm already like imagining. And, I, and I'll say sometimes, you know, so I'll, I'll, it's, it's just so freaking annoying, you know? And I had this discussion years ago with, was it, I was at a party in Staten Island and this freaking dumb fuck, this dumb fuck was saying how he was driving above the speed limit, but because he was in the fast lane, the cars that were coming behind him, too bad. So, you know, I was very, you know, polite. I was very calm about it. Yeah, Tosoro, very calm about it. So I had this conversation. I said, well, actually, you know, that's, it's called the passing lane for a reason. He goes, yeah, but I was passing cars. Great, stupid ass. But this car was going to pass you. So common sense, common sense. And I'm a New Yorker. So I was told that actually New York, this is not something that is respected. I don't know, but I'm a New Yorker. I'm a native from Brooklyn. So I don't, I don't understand like why it is that, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not even going to get into that discussion. Anyway, so this, this, this Betsuda Shonsugia was telling me that, well, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm driving, I'm passing cars. So it's okay. No, stupid fuck. You move over, let the guy go. Then you go back and then you continue your path. It's common sense. Ateista, la vita como bro, como, como, but it is batro amurus ateista. I don't, I don't get it. Move your ass over. Mette di lato. Pezzo de shunso che se tave sera se carivurierda. Oh my God, it's such an aggravating topic. And when it happens, oh God. And this is the kind of shit that I say. And I say it in front of my mom. And I don't think she appreciates it too much. But, you know, I know you guys must be saying, my God, you're such a bad piece of shit. No, I mean, well, you know, that's up for debate. But I'm not. You know, my mom is, you know, my mom's cool. But she's yelling at me. You know, it's a Sicilian lady. You know, I, have to, I curse, you know, God forbid, you know, I have to go to church and, you know, do the sign of the cross with the water and all that stuff. But that's a whole other subject. But my God. It's just common sense. It's common courtesy too. Stupid ass. You see a car behind you, you move your ass over. Now, I know what people are saying. Well, you know, you, that, that's probably women. That's probably this race. That's probably this age. No, 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 no. I'm going to disagree with all of that. It is not an age is issue. It is not a race is issue. I can't even talk. I need to relax. It is not a race issue. It is not a sex issue. It's not an age issue. It is just a fucking stupid, dumb fuck issue. Stupidity is, is just a fact of the matter. Stupidity is a state of mind. And stupidity knows no race, no age, no size, no nothing. Any person can be stupid. And I have seen people do this, amongst other things, but this one of all kinds all shapes and sizes. I've even seen some dumb fucks who are on their phones in the, in the fast lane. And they don't even, like, don't you see your mirror? Don't you see the guy flashing you behind? Don't you see a car behind you? You see, like, multiple cars behind you? Oh, my can any neighbor. My can any neighbor. Me fan nos moveri neighbor. Got chaves a dar un cavo shun tokulo. I want to kick their ass. Oh, my God. If you're doing that, you're stupid. Hear me? You are driving in the fast lane or the passing lane or the left lane, whatever you want to call it. And there are cars or a car behind you at a close proximity. And that car is catching up and it's fa driving faster than you are. And you don't move over. You're stupid. Stupid to see. Stupid to nascist. A stupid to more. You're stupid. You're born stupid. And you're going to die stupid. And that's all there is to it. Amen to that. Ooh, man. My Kenanini I get so pissed off of that one. Anyway. Okay, Lord, let's talk about some other stuff. <laughs> let's talk about some dog stuff, you know? So one step forward and two steps back is the one topic I want to go over. And I also want to talk about how 
Dogs associate certain activities and certain behaviors with the state of mind that they're in at that moment. Now, I know there's all the dog training crap and all the sit stays and the treats and all that bullshit. The truth of the matter is that what the secret to this matter and the truth of the matter is that in order to get a dog that's happy, fulfilled and well behaved, you just have to understand that whatever activity and whatever behavior you want to create and you want to teach and you want to or you want to fix, it has to be associated to the right state of mind. So let's talk about something basic, like you're teaching your dog to sit. Oh, God, whatever. It's a trick. We're going to get to that another time. I don't want to get into that. I've already went into my my rage with the freaking dumbasses in the slow lane driving, driving slow in the in the in the in, See, I, I, I'm still I'm just now I'm, I'm adding more anger. I'm said I can't any name, but I'm getting even more pissed off driving in the fast lane and in the, in the left lane, the slow driver is driving in that lane. Anyway. All right. So let me not add another topic that's going to piss me off. So um, the association of teaching, we're teaching our dog to sit, something very simple. And of course, we're going to utilize the treats and we're going to utilize the verbal commands and all that crap. Fine. Now, here's the thing. One of the mistakes, the biggest mistake that people make when they're trying to teach their dog or they're trying to fix a certain behavior or they're trying to, to, to create something. I'm going to, I'm going to use this as just something simple and basic. You're teaching your dog to sit. Let me explain something clear. Dogs do not understand the meaning of words, okay? To a dog, the word sit does not mean jack shit. When we hear the word sit, there's a meaning to it, okay? With dogs, it's association. And there's usually two associations. It's either number one, that means that my butt hits the ground. That's the association. The word does not have a meaning. It's an association. The second thing is state of mind. So if you're teaching your dog to sit, and the basic way that most people do this, unfortunately, is with excitement, okay? So now, if you're trying to teach your dog to not be excited, whether it's, I don't know, bolting out the door or jumping on people, something basic. We're not talking about major behaviors. We're talking about like basic principles. So we're teaching our dog to not be excited, okay? Whatever the translation to that becomes, whatever the, re the reason behind is, we're trying to prevent excitement. So in order to prevent excitement, we teach them to sit. Now, if we're teaching them to sit when they're in an excited state of mind, what exactly do you think you're anchoring that emotion to? I got news for you. You may not believe it, and most people don't, and that's fine. That's why I have a job, and most people like me have a job to counteract the ones that think they're doing good, is the fact that sitting in an excited state now has that behavior along with the word represents excitement. It's really that simple, okay? Sitting means get excited, okay? Much like when you call a dog's name, when you're saying, when they're excited, when they're trying to bolt out the door, when they're jumping on people, when they're barking, and you say the word, the word gets associated with the state of mind. Don't believe me? Hmm. Have you guys ever heard of the Pavlov's dog's theory? Okay. Dog salivates. I'm sorry. Dog hears a bell, starts to salivate, right? It's an association. It's state of mind with a sound or a particular behavior. So when we're trying to teach our dog certain things, such as something as basic as sitting, okay, we need to make sure that if we're going to use the command, it has to be anchored to a calm state. Otherwise, you're making them excited every time they hear the name. That's why if you repeat the word over and over and over again, or if you get angry or you get frustrated, that translates to excitement in the dog language. So you're trying to calm down an excited behavior with more excitement. No, stop. No, stop it. Get over here. No, knock it off. Step. John, John, George, Fido, 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 Fido. Fi I don't know why I'm using Fido. It's a traditional, you know, dog word. But whatever the case may be, you're using a lot of excitement. And then you get frustrated. I said, stop it. Oh my God, I'm going to kill you. That's a lot of excitement. So the more you're doing that, the more excited you're making this dog. So now every time they hear specific words, what do you think they're going to become? Pavlov's dog theory, right? I hear sit. I get excited. I hear my name. I get excited. I hear whatever. I get excited. I say vafanculo all the time to my dog. Guess what? I say vafanculo. He gets excited. You know what I'm saying? It's that simple. Okay. Our energy is mirrored by them. So the more excited we become, the more excited they are. Now it's key to anchor the word or behavior to 
the state of mind that we want them to be in. So for example, if we're talking about a dog the, that it gets excited when you want to take them out for a walk, okay, which a lot of dogs do. So if your dog is getting excited when you're trying to take them out for a walk, it usually starts in, in stages. So most people, they'll start, with, let's go for a walk. You want to go for a walk? Oh my God, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. And they'll do like this dance. And they'll, oh my God, let's go for a walk. Let's walk. Oh yeah, let's walk. Let's walk. And here's the dog jumping around in circles, spinning. So now you just took that excitement and you spiked it all the way up right? So now what are we doing? We got a level 15 of excitement. And then what we do, we take our leash, we put the leash on the dog. So now what does the leash represent? Excitement. Before we even put the leash on the dog, the dog sees the leash gets excited. How many people are in that situation? Hmm? I'm sure there's a lot. As soon as the dog sees, sees the leash, what happens? Some people, they don't just have to go near that area where the leashes are on and those dogs get all crazy. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I don't know. They don't make those sounds, but you know what I mean? Some of them do. Who knows? But my point is that the association now is as soon as you're going towards that leash, now I get excited because that's what you taught me. All these process, all this, this process, every single stage has the association of excitement, right? So now as soon as you put, you go grab the leash, the excitement, and the excitement is continuing to spike because you're not doing anything to neutralize the excitement. You're not doing anything. It's continuing to climb. Right. So now you put the leash on an excited dog. That step represent represents excitement. You hear me? Concept. La pensa. Atesto, shira, viendo, shato, shira, viendo. Excitement. So now you bring them to the door. Guess what? We're continuing to spike up. Oh my God, I get to go outside. I'm getting to go outside. Oh my God, this is so amazing. I get to go outside. I get to go outside. And then boom, they take off out the door. And now you're being dragged. My dog doesn't know how to walk. He's dragging me down the street. What the hell do you expect? You got this dog so excited, right? And then you bring him out. That's what you did. That's what you did. So now the whole process, all those stages, all those, uh, all those, those things, leash, door, everything represents excitement. And every single time you do it, guess what's going to happen? More and more excitement. That's the problem. Okay. We'll use another example. If we're talking about a dog that, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll use an example of barking. He's barking out the window. And now every single time that the dog barks out the window, you say the name, what's going to end up happening? The dog's going to hear the name, going to start barking more, going to start barking more, going to start barking more because the, you're adding fuel to this fire. You're adding fuel to this fire. You know what I mean? So this also translates into the concept of separation anxiety, for example. Okay. So separation anxiety, I mean, there's a lot of different, you know, reasons why a dog can become separate, you know, can develop separation anxiety. But basically the premise is that during the separation period, meaning while they're separated from their human, they don't know what to do with themselves. So they become a certain way. And why is that? It's simple. If you go into the process of getting them excited, basically it's a tease. Now think about this logically, your way of when you're bringing them to, when you're going towards the door, they're associating this whole step with excitement. So they're getting excited. Oh my God, he's going towards the door. He's getting ready. He's putting his shoes on. He's putting his belt on or she's putting whatever, you know, she's putting his, her, her, she's getting her purse. She's getting her keys. She's ready. Oh my God, we get to go outside. So now the excitement is kicking up. So the process of going towards this rectangle has already been taught beforehand and it all represents excitement, right? So now your dog sees this process and is already getting excited. Then you step in and you start to amp up the excitement. And this is basically when you're going to work, you're going to the store, okay? You're not really taking your dog out. So what you're doing is your steps, your process to, of getting ready to leave the house is very similar to when you take your dog out for a walk, right? Now, if you're doing that, what's happening is that your dog is, again, is associating that whole process. So they're getting excited because they're seeing this, these, these steps going on. Now, on top of that, you start to go into, oh, poor baby, you be a good boy. You be a good boy. I'm going to give you a cookie. Here's a big Kong. Here's a filet mignon. Here's a stigiola. Here's those finchone, whatever you give them. And you make this whole big production. Okay, baby. And on top of the fact, while you're getting ready, you're also making the cardinal sin of not 
making your dog go into an environment or into a state of mind of calmness. They're following you around. You know, basically they're picking up on your new normal routine thinking that they're going to be going with you because that's what you taught them. You never taught them during the separation period how they're supposed to be. Not what they're supposed to do, it's how they're supposed to be. And how are they supposed to be? Calm right? If anything, you're amping them up. So now they're like, okay, we're going to get on. So we're getting, oh, my, my, my human over here is getting ready. We're going to be going outside. And now she's talking to me and now she's giving me food and all this stuff is getting me excited because let's face it, the talking gets them excited. The food, you associated that with excitement. So everything you're doing has excited associations. Now what's going to happen is as soon as you get ready to leave the house, you got this dog at a level 15 of excitement. Now you walk out the door, slam the door in the dog's face and the dog's like, what happened? Well, we were supposed to go outside. What? Oh my God, I don't understand. What? what am I supposed to do? I'm so excited big tease you big ass tease that's how the dog is perceiving that you basically tease them into believing that something was going to happen and then you took it away that in a nutshell is what happened now am i saying you're bad about it no but this is how we we learn we have to understand the psychology of a dog so association with everything is key so when you are going through your process of whatever it is that you're doing you need to anchor those steps with what? Calmness. Calm state equals whatever it is. Okay. So going back to like the concept of getting the leash to go for a walk, it's usually the most, the most, um, the most typical one, but there's a tons of them. the other ones that I would just mentioned, but just excitement because they're going to go outside on a walk. Okay. You get them excited by the first step. And what's the first step? Is using your mouth. Avuka, beloved, the mozzarella lingua. You should bite your tongue. People talk too much to their dogs, and talking makes them excited. Yeah. Now, if you talk to your dog, is it okay? Let me let me let me backtrack this. Is it okay to talk to your dog and get him excited? Is it okay to get your dog excited? Of course it is. But when it's the right time, you know what I'm saying? It's the right time. You get them excited, but you also have to understand that excitement is like a light switch with a dimmer on it. So you need to be able to control the turning it on or turning it off, but you also need to be able to control the intensity of how high or low it gets. Make sense? Of course it does. Now, if by doing all this, we want to take our, we understand that the more we talk, the more excited our dog becomes. So the less we talk, the less excited our dog becomes, which means they become calm. Calm, la calma. Bisogna essere calme. Got to calm down. Got to learn to relax. You know what I'm saying? So the process of going for a walk should be in a relaxing experience, should be a calming experience, not a crazy ass experience. Like I see people walking their dogs and it's like they're, they're water skiing. You know, dogs are drinking. Oh, sit the foot, sit the foot, the bicep. And these people think it's okay. <laughs> he's, he's just so excited. He just loves going for a walk. <sighs> oh, Lord. Anyway, so he has a lot of things piss me off, but one step at a time. We already discussed the, one of the biggest pet peeves, but this is all part of it. This is part of the dog stuff that I've tried to educate people, the ones that want to learn, and then there's the ones that just don't give a shit and whatever. So that's what you know, we do. They'll deal with it themselves. So... Basically, what we're trying to achieve here is we're trying to achieve calm state of mind with the process. So you're about to take your dog for a walk. What are you going to not do? I'll give you a second. If you said not talk, you are correct. Ding, ding, ding. You win a prize. I'm not saying what it is because you really did it. But good job. If you said that, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. You don't talk. You could say a word, but you can't get them amped up. If you get them amped up, it's on you. You're the stupid ass. If you get them amped up and then you are pissed off when you're there, you're there when they're dragging your ass down the street, that's on you. You created that. Take responsibility. Don't say, well, this dog is really, he gets really excited. I can't calm him down. But so there's room so can see. You freaking created that. So shut up. Shh. Close your mouth. Don't talk. Quiet. Calm. So now you start the process of creating the walking system, the walking process, okay? 
go grab your leash. So now if you go grab your leash, what are you going to do? Your dog starts getting excited. What do you do? Here's what you do. Nothing. Oh my God. Are you supposed to do nothing? Yeah. Because if your dog is getting excited and now you're engaging them, you are rewarding and you're acknowledging excitement. So you just ignore that. You have to understand that it's okay to ignore a behavior. You want to know why? You're not, they're not going to be upset. Oh, my, he they get so upset. He's going to be so upset, mad. He's going to go on Twitter and badmouth me. No, he's not going to do that. You want to know why? Because he's a dog. First of all, that's obviously the case. But the one thing that's important is that you're diffusing the situation. He's looking for a reason to continue to get excited. If you don't give him a reason, he can't continue to go up. He's getting excited. You're just holding a leash. And he's going to look at you like, okay. Now, if you start talking, start screaming, no, no, stop it. No, what are you doing? No, stop it. No, you're throwing more excitement on an excited fire. Make sense? Mm, okay. So that being said, you wait. You wait for what? I'm getting to it. Calm down. Relax. <laughs> I love doing this. So what are you going to wait for? You're going to wait. Now we talk about the work rules reward formula. Okay. So in this case, every single step represents what you're going to give him as a reward, but he needs to follow rules by working mentally in order to get whatever it is that that reward is. So in this case, what's the rule? Like he wants that leash on his, on, on him because he knows that that thing goes on me. We get to go for a walk. But if you put it on excite and an excited state of mind, what's going to happen? You're rewarded excitement. Bingo. That's the problem. We don't want to reward excitement. We do not want to nurture excitement. We want this climbing ladder to stop and come down. Now, we can't wait for it to go. If it's already at a 10, especially if you're, if you're starting this off right, then it's easier to do. But if you're already like taught your dog to get excited, now you got to like rehabilitate that whole process. So if your dog starts off at a level 10, we can't wait for them to go from a 10 down to a zero until we put the leash on their, on them. What we have to do is we have to reward the progress. Meaning if they go down from a 10 to a nine without you saying a word, don't go into the sit, 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 stay, stay. Oh, what a good boy. Oh, what a good boy. Because you freaking just got them excited. You fucker. You understand? Don't get them excited. Metodolondeista. Don't get them excited. So, we wait for them to go from a 10 to a nine. Why is that important? Because you just rewarded the nine, okay? You just took them from a 10 to a nine and reward the nine. And now we are acknowledging that moment and rewarding that moment. So they started to come down. We reward that. Is that good? No, but it's progress. And that what we're going to go after. We're going to get into that in a second. And, you know, not in a second, another podcast. But we just acknowledged and rewarded that improvement, okay? We just put a leash on a calmer dog. Let me, re re let me repeat that. You just put the leash on a calmer dog. So you did not put the leash on a level 10 dog. You put the leash at a level nine dog after they came down from a level 10. So is that good? Yes, it's good because you just taught them exactly what you're trying to accomplish. The next time we're not going to do a level, a level nine anymore. Now we want an eight. Make sense? But, so we're continuing to reward that progress until you re re they realize, okay, so this is the level I'm supposed to be at level zero before I get this leash put on me. So if I want that leash on me, I got to be calm. And the leash represents level zero. The leash represents calmness, not craziness, not excitement. Make sense? And that's the process you apply through every stage. Every single stage that you're going through, that is exactly what you're doing. You are rewarding and nurturing those stages. Does this make sense? Because this is key when it comes to understanding why dogs behave a certain way. It's because they associate certain behaviors and activities with a, say, a certain state of mind. And it's taught by us. The state of mind that they become is taught by us based on the behavior that they're doing, whether it's aggressive, whether it's fear, whether it's nervousness, whether it's uncertainty, whether it's excitement, whether it's whatever. It's all based on that state of mind that they're in at that moment and whatever's going on around them at that moment. So the two come together. Make sense? Does this make sense? Association. Remember that word, association. So if you want to fix the problem, you have to associate. I'm sorry. You want them to associate that behavior and or activity 
with that with a, with a certain state of mind. You know what I mean? And that's really the key. And you can't go into or fall into the trap of dog training concepts, which are the body. Because with dog training, and we're going to get into that on a separate podcast, and I'm going to really get into that hardcore. Dog training is all about what the body does. The body needs to sit. The body needs to lay down. At what point do we focus on the brain? Because I got to tell you, the brain is really what counts. Most of the time, if you have a dog that's excited and they're sitting, right, and you put the leash on them, you still put the dog, but put you still put the leash on an excited dog. You ain't accomplished shit just because their ass hit the floor. It doesn't mean anything because they're still excited. I equate that to a car that has the parking brake on and the gas pedals floored. That's what I equal it to. As soon as that parking brake goes down, that car takes off. You know what I'm saying? And the same thing happens with your dog. As soon as the door opens, boom, that dog takes off. Because if you think about it, that's what ends up happening. You use a bunch of treats. Treats equals excitement. Again, you're rewarding the state of mind. So what you want to reward is the right state of mind. Does this make sense? I mean, it's not really that difficult to understand. Reward state of mind. Don't reward what the body's doing. I don't give a rat's ass if the dog is spinning on their head. Sit, staying, lay down. I don't give a shit. I care about the brain. Because again, and if you think about this, and I mean, be honestly, think about it. How many times have you put a leash on a dog and you make them sit, 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 and you go, what a good boy, what a good boy. And they're sitting, but they're excited. And, they're, and you can see them like shaking and ready to go. And they're ready to go. And they're, oh, oh my, they're, and you can see that. So you're just rewarding what the body's doing, but the brain is not doing what it's supposed to. So you haven't, a fi- you haven't fixed anything. Association, okay? Let the dog associate activity and or behavior with the right state of mind. And what's the right state of mind? Calmness. And always remember, when you're rehabilitating the levels, the high levels, don't wait for them to come all the way down. Drop down one, capture that moment, capture that moment that they're dropping down just a notch, they're improving, they're calmer, and you reward that and you acknowledge that. You know what I'm saying? So you put the leash on that. And I'm just using this as an example, but in every kind of behavior, that's the pattern. And I don't give a flying shit when anybody says, well, no, you use the treats. You have your little bag of treats on your hips. Then you just throw treats. Stupid asses with the tree. You just, no, I'm not bribing my dogs. I want my dogs to be mentally stable. I want my dogs to be mentally healthy. I want them to be fulfilled and well-behaved and happy. And when they're excited, I got news for you. They ain't happy. Okay. And this is, I could prove this to you, okay? Happiness and excitement, people think that they're the same thing. No, they're not. Have you ever seen a child at a restaurant who is screaming at the top of their lungs, running around in circles, bumping into waiters, knocking people over, knocking dishes and glasses over? Are they excited or are they happy? Is that acceptable or is it not? Yeah, that's what I thought. And if you say that's acceptable, then you're a stupid ass and you need the rehabilitation yourself. Anyway, whoo, man, I'm getting carried away here with stuff. Anyway, so, so remember, association. I said this a million times, but it's worth repeating because I want to get this ingrained in your mind. Association of a behavior and or an activity with a particular state of mind. And the state of mind that you should be anchoring that is calmness. Now, if you're throwing the ball around the backyard, is it okay for them to be excited when they see the ball? Sure. But again, right time, because then you run into the situation. As soon as you grab a ball, that dog's bouncing off the wall. So you want to, again, I said this before, treat excitement like a light switch with a dimmer on it. So you're controlling the intensity. You're controlling the excitement. You know what I mean? So it's when it's time to play, when it's time to not play, you're in control. You have to set the tone. And if you don't believe that, Okay, so understanding that when you're teaching this kind of stuff, there's going to be there's going to be ups and downs, especially if you're trying to rehabilitate a behavior. Again, we'll just keep the concept of the of the of the of the leash and going for a walk, um, you know, and with the representation of excitement with that, we'll just use we'll just use uh, that as our example. There, when you're, if you're rehabilitating the fact that your dog, as soon as you see, as soon as they 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 um, they see the leash or as soon as you put it on them and as soon as you take them out, they rep- that, that they get into level 10 of excitement. So that's the association there. Leash, walking, all that crap represents excitement at a level 20. Now we have to rehabilitate all that stuff, right? And so what's important to understand with this is the process that is the concept. What's important to understand with that is the concept that 
there's going to be ups and downs. And this is where what I call two steps forward, one step back comes into play. Okay. And this is something that also applies to our lives. This applies to us as well, because listen, everything we're talking about is about training people, not training dogs. And we're not just training people to train dogs. We're training people to be better humans, to be happy and fulfilled and successful in all our different areas of life. So it's not just about being, being understanding of what we need to do for our dogs. It's about being understanding of what we need to do for ourselves overall in every single area of life. So when we take two steps forward, one step back, that's kind of like the pattern. So if we're talking about dog rehabilitation and we're talking about teaching our dog to behave different, differently um, in different situations or to act differently in different situations, you got to understand here that it's not always going to be progressing forward. It's not going to always be moving forward. It's going to be a point. There's going to be points when you're going to be moving and then you're going to step back. And it's not just two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it's two steps forward, two steps back. Sometimes it's three steps forward, four steps back. Sometimes it's two steps forward, no steps back. Then it's three steps forward, one step back. The point of it is that we're continuing to move forward and there's going to be ups and downs. It's part of life. You know what I'm saying? And when we're teaching our dog, when we're trying to teach our dogs to, to, to do certain things, we have to be patient. We talked about faith and patience. So you have to be understanding that Faith is what you're going to be is, is your, you have faith in the fact that we're going to, that you're going to get this. And you have faith in the fact that you're going to be able to teach your dog. And you also have faith in your fact that your dog is going to do that. So you have faith in the fact that all those three are in line, but you also are patient, not just with yourself because you're also learning. And this is where a lot of people fall, fall apart because it's all about the dog. I'm training the dog. That pisses me off. Like you can't imagine you're not training shit. You're training yourself. That's what we're trying to do here is we're teaching you what your dog needs. Your dog doesn't need the little freaking kangaroo pouch on your belt with all the freaking treats in there. That's not what your dog needs. Your, de- your dog needs somebody who understands them as dogs, their brain, their way of communicating. Make sense? So you have to be patient because it's a process to get that, right? You have to be patient with yourself that you're going to be learning in one step forward, and I'm sorry, two steps, you're going to be learning in two steps forward, one step back. It's a process. So you got to be patient with that. You're going to get it some days, some days are going to be good, some days are going to be bad. Three days are going to be great. One day is going to be okay. It's just a process. You know, you can't just get yourself down when one thing goes wrong or one day goes wrong, you know, and the same thing is with your dog. It's your dog's behavior is a certain way, you know, and, and it's the same thing. It's not uncommon for dogs to move forward and then to just regress all of a sudden. It's not uncommon. Why know why? Because a lot of times it could be a testing situation. They could be saying, hmm, you know what? You're changing the rules around here. I want to see if you're serious. So let me go back to the way I was and let's see what you do about it. And if you don't continue the steps, if you don't continue the process, then they're going to realize, ah, oh, so you were just full of shit back then. You were just, that was just a fad. You, you really weren't serious about it. And then they go back to their old ways of being, you know? It's also very common that if you fix or rehabilitate a certain behavior in certain areas, all of a sudden they'll start, they'll start doing something in something completely different. So, you know, they'll, they'll, you fix the, I don't know, I'm just going to make some, some examples up. You fix the housebreaking issue and, you know, they're not peeing in the house anymore, but all of a sudden they're chewing on the furniture. You know, it's not uncommon because again, you fix this and you did it the right way. You were calm, you were persistent, you addressed it. And now they're saying, hmm, you know what? Let me see if this is real. Let me try something over here. And now you're gonna, they're going to test you over there and they want to see how you react and how you deal with that situation. You know, So you took two steps forward in one area, but now you're taking a step back in another. That's okay because it's not, it's not unusual for clients to say to me, yeah, you know what? It's incredible. This whole thing, we fixed this, but then all of a sudden he did this situation and then he never did this before. It's normal. It's normal for them to test different areas. It's normal that as you're fixing one thing, something else just pops up. It's just normal. It's like it's like when you fix your fix, fix, when you stick your finger in a in a in a, in a dam that's the the where the water's coming out of, and then all of a sudden the water comes out of a different hole. It's the same. It's the same thing. So give yourself under, give yourself some time, and understand that it's common. It's normal. 
So don't really deal, don't really worry about it too much. Just go through the process. The process, the steps are the same. They never change. So if there, you fix this area by doing this particular process, then all you have to do is just do the same thing over here and you'll fix it. Okay. Because your dog is looking to see how you react and how you deal with it. And that's really the important thing. It's not the techniques that you're applying. It's really your attitude about it that matters. If all of a sudden you get all frustrated, then you're just showing that you, you just, you're just, you're just full of shit and you can't be trusted. They won't trust, respect, or follow that because you prove that you're just, you're just full of shit. You know what I mean? And that's why it's important. Um, and, and, and taking two step, one step forward, I'm sorry, two, and, and taking two steps forward and one step back is, is a common thing. And I know that all too well, you know, even in life, you know, when, 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 um, when we're trying to do something and we're trying to, to move forward. Um, and it's happened to me on multiple occasions. So like, like, you know, I was, I was very shy and insecure um, and, 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 and just awkward. Like I was socially awkward, you know, pretty much most of my life and um, until college, as a matter of fact. And so when I was living in Brooklyn, you know, I, I moved to Italy when I was 10 years old and just to give you an idea how shy I was, my kindergarten teacher, you know, had to slap me in the face. I mean, it was more like a tap than anything else, but um, God forbid, you know, it was, no, it wasn't a big deal, but she, you know, she, she did that because like, she would ask me, she would talk to me, she would ask me questions and I just wouldn't answer her. And it's not like I was being a, a dick about it. I just was so shy. Like I didn't want to talk. And Finally, I had no friends, you know, no, no friends in school. I had, I had friends in school that were basically just, you know, the kind of friends you make because, you know, your parents invite you to each other's birthday, but there was no friendship there or anything. And then finally, I started making friends with two kids who, um, who moved into my neighborhood. And so I had just started making friends. I was just starting to come out of my shell a little bit. And then I got a bombshell, which was, we were moving to Italy and, you know, that kind of like, you know, I was, I was going to a whole other country, different culture, you know, it was just, it was, it just brought me all the way back. So here I am 10 years old in Italy and back to square one, you know, being bullied. I started getting bullied when I was in Italy. I don't remember if I was being bullied when I was, uh, when I was in Brooklyn, I don't think so, but, um, maybe I was actually now that I'm thinking about it, but but I remember, you know, been in Italy, I was, you know, being bullied because, you know, here I was, I was the American guy. And I thought, oh my God, everybody's going to think I'm the greatest, but my personality wasn't there to support it. You know, my personality was like insecure and awkward and shy. And, and, you know, just like with dogs, people will target weakness, you know? And so I wasn't a dominant figure. I wasn't a confident person. I wasn't, you know, an assertive individual. I was the picture of weakness. So they targeted me and I was, you know, I remember, you know, they used to put like cockroaches on my shoulders and on my head and, and they used to push me and stuff and uh, call me names and, and trip me down the stairs. And they, that, that was how, what I had to do. And I, I didn't know how to fight back. I mean, I was just, you know, I was just the, I was the bullied. I was basically the bullied. And so um, that happened for most of the time that I lived in Italy, I had no friends. I mean, you know, really wasn't doing anything, wasn't going out. Like, again, I was just a loner and just go to school, come home. And it was just, it was, it was, it was, I was, I was so shy and I didn't really want to talk to anybody, you know? And then finally, same pattern, finally made some friends. I remember their names, Dario and Francesco. Um, and we started hanging out and we started, you know, I went to the, we started going to the gym with them. We took up karate classes and we started going out and on the weekends and, you know, my life became like normal, you know, like a normal kid, a normal teenager. And then bombshell number two, two steps forward, one step back, back to America. And so back to America at the age of 17 now. Back to America and, of course, culture shock all over again because, you know, the lifestyle was completely different from what I was used to, you know, so two steps forward, one step back. And, you know, I had to deal with like the school system and, 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 and again, the, the culture and, and the language. Even I mean, I did speak English, but it was different. You know, uh, I wasn't like, like, you know, it wasn't my, my first language. My first language was Italian at that point. Just like when I moved to Italy, my first language was English. And then I had to be made to become Italian. So, and it's easy to like, understand like what that means is, you know, like when you think about something, when I was in Brooklyn, when I was thinking about something, I would think about it in English. When I was in Italy, I started thinking about it in English. And then all of a sudden I started thinking about it in Italian. So every time I thought it was in Italian. And the same thing happened when I moved back. 
I was thinking in Italian and then transitioned into English. So that's kind of like what my first language was. And kind of like the same thing was happening when you know, I was in high school, you know, getting bullied around, getting pushed into girls' locker rooms, having my pants pulled down in the gyms and just, you know, being talked talk to and, you know, being made fun of for the way I dressed and all that kind of shit. Again, I was a fish out of water. Like I didn't look or act like everybody else. And so I stood out and my insecurity was just there. And again, weakness and targeting weakness. So I was just, you know, I was, I was a pushover. I was the one that they targeted because they could, you know, and I didn't fight back because I couldn't, you know, it was that simple. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's tough because then, you know, you kind of feel like you're behind and that's really where I felt what I felt like for, for mo most of my life. I, I used to fight with doubt and fight with worry and fight with fear. Every decision that I made, because I didn't know, um, you know, no, I, I didn't, I didn't, I had no self-esteem. I didn't, I didn't feel good about myself. So, you know, I didn't really, um, I didn't really know how to overpower that. I didn't really know how to move past that. So every time I was supposed to do something, something even simple, it was just like a battle of fear and doubt and worry. That's everything that was going on in my, in my mind. So, you know, just to give you like an example, like a lot of that is still there to a certain extent this much, you know, and it's not all the time, but because it's so, so like ingrained there's sometimes like that shit just bubbles up and I got to like squash it there, which I've fought my whole life to get rid of it. And, but you know, there's always that little bit of residual. So it kind of like bubbles up and I just squash it back down. But um, you know, back then it wasn't that easy. Like that's, that's my, re that was my reality. You know, like I didn't have a, I, my first date wasn't until I was 22. I was maybe even 23, you know, when peer kids are going out with girls at 15, not me, I, my first date was at 22, 23 years old, you know, and I was behind the eight ball and, and everything because of the fact that, you know, I didn't think that who, who's going to like me, what, what girl is going to want to be, that was what's going on in my, that, that used to go on in my mind all the time. Who's going to want to me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cool. I'm not, I'm not desirable. I'm not funny. I'm not good looking. I'm that's, I know hard to imagine. Right. But yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it was, it was, um, it was, the, it was my reality. That's what I lived with. That's what, that's who I was. And so, you know, when it came to like having a battle and uh, doing, you know, doing something because I did not believe in myself, because I didn't uh, believe of my, any of my capabilities, anything that I was going to do was a problem. You know, like even when I started doing this podcast, like the first thought in my mind was, you can't do this. You know what I mean? You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not meant for this. You're not capable. This is like the battle that goes on in my head sometimes. And I got to fight it to get rid of it. And it's easy now, easier now you know, to, to, to squash it down. So, you know, you, you know, I, my, my, my self-esteem is so, is so much more powerful and so much more stable that I could push the insecurities and the doubts aside and just blast right through them, but they're still there and on the surface, you know? So like, you know, sometimes it's easy to kind of like let those fears conquer you. And it did sometimes. So like, for example, when it came to like the podcasting situation, um, you know, I had the doubts as to whether I could pull this off. So I wasn't sure how to do it. And I was awkward and I was uncomfortable. So I practice, you know, I, we talked about practicing before the big game. That's exactly what I did. I was like, I don't have to get on here live and just start doing it. Let me just make some shit up. Let me get comfortable with talking to myself because swing your forward. This is, this is what it felt like. I'm like, what am I crazy? I'm talking to myself. That's where, where my head was at. But, you know, my reasoning behind wanting to do this was to teach, inspire, and entertain. You know, I, I know, um, you know, I, I know why I'm doing this and I know why I want, I know, I know, I know why I'm doing this. And I know that I need to do this because there's a lot to offer, you know, uh, I have a lot of experience, a lot of, ex a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that I could share, you know, and if it helps just one person dog related, you know, human related, you know, inspirational, if you just want to laugh at my goofiness, whatever, it's cool. It's, it's fine by me. I'm okay with that. You know, if you don't like me, if you think I'm too, whatever, I'm, I'm okay with that too. You know, I'm again, my self-esteem is at a point where I don't give a shit what people think about it, but I do have the inner battle within myself. And that's really where uh, I feel a lot of people are, is they have that, that, that voice in their heads that's constantly telling you you're no good. You can't do it. And, you know, and 
like I said, when I first started doing this podcasting thing, I just would practice, you know, so I would get in front, put the mic in front of my face and just talk random shit. And then when I got comfortable, I said, you know what, let's do the first one. And I did. And it's not, I'm not going to lie. I'm not thrilled. I'm not thrilled with the first couple because I wasn't comfortable. But if I continue to allow that doubt, that fear, that, that insecurity, that worry to beat me, then I'm never going to feel comfortable. I just have to jump in and just start doing them. And that's what happened. And now I got to tell you, I don't know what you guys think about it, but I think I'm pretty comfortable about it. And I'm, again, I'm still improving. I'm still growing and I will always do that. But, you know, um, I want, I want, I wanted to bring this up because, you know, there's going to be setbacks, including like we're talking about this podcast. So like, there was a couple of them when I, when I, when I, when I did them there, I was just off, you know, and the messages that I was trying to convey when I had the discussion with my team, it just wasn't there. And I knew it and I wanted them to see it. I'm like, what do you guys think? And they're like, eh. and I'm like, yeah, hey, that's what I thought, you know, and it's two steps forward, one step back. Did I get down in the press? Like, oh, fuck, you know, I knew I sucked. No, it's two steps forward, one step back because we're continuing to move forward and we're continuing to improve, to grow, to, 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 gr to get better in the areas that we were weaker in, you know? And so, and so the same pattern happens with our dogs, right? So if we're trying to teach our dogs something, don't be afraid if all of a sudden it's like not perfect. Because the one thing that annoys me more than anything is when people don't look, when my clients don't acknowledge the massive progress that they've made and they acknowledge the one bad day, that infuriates me so much, not just because of the progress issue, but also how does that reflect with your freaking dog, you know? If, let's say we're using housebreaking as an example here. Let's use housebreaking. So if you, you had a dog that was constantly having accidents, let's say five days a week was having accidents in the house. And for the last three months, no accidents at all. And then one accident. And people will tell me this. And I was like, you know, what, Pat, I'm so pissed off. Son of a bitch. So aggravated. What's the problem? Son of a bastard. You know, three months, everything was great. And then just last week, this son of a bitch, he just peed on my floor. Okay. You want me to play the, the guitar, a violin? What, what, what are you saying here? You just said you had three months that were great and then one incident. So we're pissed off about the one incident, the one incident but we forget about the three months. I don't get that. I mean, your dog is going to see that and say, so why, what is my incentive to continue to move forward to get better if you don't give a shit about progress, if you don't see and acknowledge and respect the fact that I'm getting better at this, you know, because I got news for you. This is not about the dog. This is about you too. So some people put all the pressure on the dog. You know, the dog needs to get better. The dog needs to improve. Some people put a lot of pressure on themselves. You know, I can't do this. I'm not sure. Guess what? It's not about either one. It's about you just following the steps of improving and getting better, of continuing to move forward, regardless of how many step, steps back you take. You take two steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, three steps back. Two steps forward, one step back. It's still, you're still continuing to move forward. That's the point. And the more you continue to move forward, eventually, there's no step back, step backs. Sometimes there still is. I mean, listen, it's part of life, no matter how great life is. That's why I always say to people, you know, when, when, I, when I talk to them about faith and patience, I say it's easy for people to have faith and to be calm when things are going the right way. Everything is great. You're walking your dog down the street and you're nice and calm. And this is what people tell me. You know, I'm, I'm calm. When I'm walking down the street, I'm calm. But I don't get, I get nervous, I get scared, I get angry, I get frustrated, whatever, when another dog comes towards me. Okay, so what do you do then? Well, I, I, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm, I can't be calm anymore. Well, that's your problem. If you remain calm in, this, in spite of what's coming towards you, everything would be fine. And I guarantee that everything would be fine because your dog would be like, oh, okay, so there's no problems here. You're still calm. So there's no threat. Okay. But if all of a sudden you're getting pissed off and they're getting anxious or nervous or fearful or whatever, your dog's like, oh shit. Hmm, I guess what's coming towards us is bad, huh? Okay. All right. I mean, you get ready to fight. You, you, you're sure you, you can't, you, 
You don't seem, you don't seem in control. You're still nervous. Okay. My mommy's nervous. All right. Let me do my thing. That's what's going to happen. It's easy to stay calm and in control when everything is going right. And most people, again, when it goes back to like faith and patience, most people don't pray to God until their ass is, in, is on fire, until they got a problem. You know what I mean? Until they got a problem, so now they turn to God. What happened beforehand? What happened with all the good stuff? You didn't give a shit? You didn't care? Just like will some people will call you when they need your ass, but if they don't need you, they'll say to hell with you. That doesn't happen, right? No, no, no. It does happen. You know what I mean? And so the whole point of it is you don't want to let a setback influence you. You don't want to let that setback, small as it is, become a big thing. You don't want to become the kind of people that if I sprinkle the whole floor, and I'm not doing this, by the way, but I'm not doing that. I'm sprinkling the whole floor with diamonds. And then I put one tiny rock on there and your goddamn focus is on that freaking rock. Don't be those people. Okay. You have to look at the big picture. It's a rock. Just push it out of the way. And enjoy all those diamonds. Now I'm not doing it. Don't, them go, don't come to me and say, well, well, where's my diamonds? I'm not doing it. That's the premise of it. Okay. Is two steps forward. One step back is still good because as much as like for me, you know, it did affect, um, it did affect my, my, um, my confidence. It did affect my self-esteem. It still helped in the grand scheme of things because the whole, the whole way things evolved was still beneficial. You know, like the experience that I got from both aspects of it was still great. You know, how many people can say that they've, you know, moved to two countries with the, before the age of 17, you know, back and forth, you know, and, and regardless of the fact now that we are in a different stage, I feel like my personal experience with battling those, those emotions help individuals as individuals, but they also help dog owners that they can transfer that to their dogs. You know, like I said, I've struggled with fear, insecurity, anxiety, and all that kind of stuff because of, you know, who I was, but it's not who I am, you know? And so people need to understand that they can overcome that. They can, they don't need medication to overcome that. All they need is, to, is just to continue to push forward. You know, you continue to push forward regardless of one day you're feeling great and the next day you're not feeling good. Okay, well, you're back to where you were. That's okay. And then the next day you're not feeling good again. Okay, but here's what happens. If you start to let that affect you and that becomes your reality, you're going to start to sink and sink fast. It's just the fact of the matter. Your job is to continue to press forward. Like, okay, I'm having a bad day. I'm having a bad moment, you know, and then you fight through it and then you continue to fight through it you know, and then you're gonna have a setback. Okay, I'm having a bad day. I'm having two bad days. You know what? Let's get back into it. Into it. And the same thing with your dog. Don't crucify your dog because all of a sudden you fix one thing and something else is going wrong. Don't crucify your dog because, you know, he had a week of greatness and, you know, a bad moment, a bad day. Don't crucify your dogs if you have, if you used to have, seven days of bad days beforehand. And now it's six days are bad and one day is good. Well, yeah, but it's still six days. Most of the week is still bad. Yeah, but it's still better than it was, which means he's getting better. He's improving. You know what I'm saying? So if you don't acknowledge that, then where's your dog's incentive to get better? Where's your incentive to continue to do the things that got you that improvement? Make sense, right? So you can't, you can't let the step back affect your ability and desire to step forward, you know, continue to step forward. You continue to move forward, even if there's step backs, it's that simple, you know, with yourself, but also with your dog. So two steps forward, one step back, still cool. You're still good. Got it. Listen, guys, I had fun. Hope you guys learned something. If you want to talk about anything in particular, if you have any questions on anything, let me know. Be patient, positive, peaceful, and persistent. It's about training people, not training dogs. It's about being happy, fulfilled, and successful, making a dog happy, fulfilled, and well-behaved. But it all starts on the human side. So any guy, if you guys have any questions on anything, let me know. 
I had fun. Hope you guys had fun and you learned something. I am Pat the Pac-Man. This is Barking for Balance. Catch you next time.